Hello, legends and super legends. Welcome to Velo Harmony Live. Subscriber Hangout. It's good to be back. Hump day here. We got a lot of thunderstorms in the area. It's rumbling. You may hear some of it. Hopefully, it won't interrupt the power. Because uh, uh, my machine and everything is, is on battery backup, but the internet, once it flickers, it does not keep the connection. But uh, we should be good. We haven't had any issues. We've been getting thunderstorms every afternoon. So it's very humid here in Houston, Texas. Let's see here. I want to start off talking about frames today. I was, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I follow the Tour de France. Um, I don't watch it live because it's too many commercials and they show it early in the morning. And I usually work out early in the morning because it's cooler. So I record it and then I can speed it up. And uh, I think it was stage eight. I was uh, watching stage eight and there was a crash. And what blew my mind was the guy's name is uh, Gianni Mosconi, I believe. He, um, his frame, it was a slow speed crash. They were, they were descending into the city. And so they slowed down. And there was a team, uh, EF, I think it was Education First Rider, that slid out. He lost his wheel. And so slow speed crash. In, in, in fact, it was so slow that one of the Ineos guys just unclipped and left the bike and didn't even fall and just walked away. You know, that's how slow it was. But Gianni Moscone's frame, the F12, snapped in two. And the reason why I brought it up is that we're spending all these thousands of dollars. I don't even know what the F12 12 sells for. Let me see. Pinarello F12. So we're talking $13,000 if you get the discs. So let's say even if it's 10,000, 13 something. So $13,000 a slope speed crash. Nothing major, just a minor crash. And the bike snapped, the top two snapped, the down two snapped. He basically had to stand on the side of the road waiting for a new bike. So imagine if that happened to you after spending 13 large. So if you're going to get a carbon bike, I think you need to get some insurance on it because they're just, I've never, you know, that's why I put my money on metal bikes. I've never had that problem. So it just snapped and it was a minor thing. The guy didn't even get hurt or not. I mean, just a slow speed crash stuff that can happen to any one of us minor. And it just, and he's standing there. It took pictures of it. I actually made a screenshot because I was watching it. And just to talk about it today. So if you have carbon bikes and you've spent a lot on it, get some kind of insurance. They have Velo insurance. They have insurance for, for cycling because uh, they, they just don't, they don't hold up. They're too fragile. You know, he was very frustrated just standing there. You know, the rest of the guys got back on their bikes and took off. So it's like a fluke, you know, but the bike should not snap in such a minor crash like that. So, uh, I guess they're going for lighter and lighter stuff. And I noticed in the picture that he was, uh, let's see, his bike was outfitted with, let me pull up the picture. There's a brand of wheels called Lightweight. I think it's made in Germany. And they're like five grand for the pair. And so you're talking about a $20,000 bicycle just sitting there, snapped in two by the side of the road on stage eight. And so... Be careful when you spend your money on uh, these bikes because they're just not, they're not durable. And for, you know, just minor, minor fall and the bike basically was history. So let's see here. I got uh, an email from Robert Tangler. He's not here yet. Um, he was talking about, because I get a lot of people that come to the studio for bike fits and they'll come with a frame that's too small, too large, because they went to the bike shop and some person at the bike shop just sold them what they had. And so I get, you know, I get them as close as possible, but then I explain to them, hey Adam, I explain to them that you you're stuck with this frame. I can make it work for you, you know, within reason. If it's just too small, too big, and I tell them you need. So to make a long story short. Robert Tangler's planning on getting a bike sizing done because 
he has a trike right now and he's thinking about getting a road bike down the road and he's doing it right. You know, and that, that's one of the benefits of this channel is that you educate people so you don't go to the bike shop and be at the mercy of someone who's there that's trying to unload a bike they have in stock and might stick you on a bike that's two centimeters too big or two centimeters too small because you can still ride it, but it's not your ideal frame because that's their motive. They want to sell what they have. You know, so you need to be armed with information before you get out there. Hey, Dan, Dan, welcome. <clears throat> so Adam says, my friends are doing 40 mile chain gangs. I'm not a fan of chain gangs. Should I just do 40 miles at threshold to replicate so I don't fall behind? I don't do a lot of, uh, on this session here, I don't do a lot of, I don't know what you're doing, Adam. You're not somebody I coach. I don't know what's going on with you. So I can't give you advice on training. You know, I, I just, it, it's like, uh, it's like calling up a doctor and say, oh, I got a headache. So prescribe something. So I, I, I can't give you advice on training. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what kind of training you've been doing. I don't know your fitness level. I don't know anything biometrically about you. So it's kind of, it would be useless to tell you what to do. But if you want to ride with the effort that the chain gang is doing, then yeah, do the same effort on your own. You know, I don't do chain gangs. I don't know who came up with that foolishness. Uh, most of my riding is solo. I do one group ride, a mean group ride on Saturday, and that's it. I don't, I don't do too many group rides. I, I'll do uh, grand fundos and stuff from time to time. But yeah, um, we have them around here. I'm sure I've heard of them. But uh, I'm not into these mass things that, you know, unless it's really structured. I'll do the WCC ride and the Team RR because those guys are generally safe. I don't like to just ride with cyclists that I don't know that well because they do crazy stuff sometimes. So, yeah, so be careful with those things. Dan Dan says, what is the 375 number on the back of the wall in the videos? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a grand fundle that I did that uh, uh, I'm fond of. So I just put the, the number that you get when you sign up. We don't, we don't pin our numbers on our kit. We use a double-sided uh, uh, tape because it ruins your jersey. I spent a lot of money on my kit. I'm not gonna put pins through it. So I use double-sided tips, so it's easy. And I, when I took it off, I just stuck it on the wall as a remembrance. There are certain rides I do, like Grand Fundos and stuff now, that I would repeat. Like when I used to race, there were certain races that I found that I wanted to do every year. So you always have rides. I'm sure you guys have done rides where you have your favorite. So that's what it is. It's a, it's a grand fund that I went to, and that was the number from it. So I just kind of put it up there to remind me to consider doing that the next time it comes around. Because I usually have them every year around the same date. <clears throat> Adam says his FTP is 258, aiming for 300. Adam, you need to get a, either a coach or you need to get a training plan because if you have structure, you get there with less effort, less pain, quicker than just riding around or jumping with a group because the group will dictate what you do. So I do most of my training by myself so I can stay with my program. And so when I ride with a group, I never ride very hard. Most of the riding I do that you guys see on tape is really recreational. When I, when I do go hard, like that time I did that sprint up, up the hill, uh, I don't like to do that too much because a lot of the guys that we ride with, they don't want to go that hard, you know, unless well, I would start doing that when I start to ride with Moles group because they, they go faster. But a lot of the guys, a lot of times you go so hard, it breaks up the group and it changes the dynamic. So on that ride that I did that sprint, those guys left Paul and I at the store. <laughs> they didn't want to have anything to do with us. After that, Paul was inside getting water or whatever, and it took off, knowing that he was inside. 
So a lot of the group don't really like that that much. I don't really care. I do what I want and you should do what you want. Just have your fun. I don't really worry about it. But a lot of times when I go to the groups, I will chase down something or play with them when they start. I don't like to initiate a lot of stuff because when I go hard, I go really hard because when I train, I train a lot harder than I when I ride with those guys. Uh, Adam, look on the website, veloharmony.com, and get one of those plans. If you if you want to build up your functional threshold power and you know how to train by yourself, uh, you can get one of the workout plans out there. That will give you some kind of structure to follow. You can get like the preseason plan, the in-season plan. There's a lot of workouts in there that will get your threshold up to par. The workouts are based on power zones and heart rate zones. So you need to know your zones. If you are, it sounds like you already know your zones. I hope you're not just training to numbers, because the numbers don't mean anything unless you know your zones. And what I mean is, you don't just train; you rest. That's the cycle: train, rest. So if you don't rest enough, you won't be re recovered enough to really grow, and you end up plateauing, and your performance can can go down. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Let's see here. Robert, welcome. Yeah, I was just talking about you, Robert, before you got here. I was telling the guys uh, that uh, you you sent an email talking about doing bike sizing because uh, the reason I brought it up was that I get a lot of people that come for fits and the bikes are too big, too small because some genius at the bike shop just sold them a bike. And this channel is bringing a lot of business for the bike fit stuff that I do because we're attracting on YouTube a lot of new writers because there's no, you know, they like the, the, the resource, the information. And so when they show up, they don't know that they've been in a way taken. And it bothers me that these bike shops are doing that because they're selling them frames that are too big for them, too small. And sometimes I can fit them, but I explain to them, it's still your feel. The bike doesn't feel the same, you know. And those of you who just got here, I, I mentioned also that if you're going to buy a bike, be careful with these carbon bikes because I've been following the Tour de France and uh, stage eight. I record the tour and then I play it back because I, I don't like the commercials. They run too many commercials. So when I play it back, I can speed it up. So I record it. Plus, it's early in the morning and that's when I work out. Uh, on stage eight, there was a slow speed crash in town where e an EF rider lost his wheel. Ineos, the team Ineos guys fell. In fact, the, the, it was so slow that one of the team Ineos guys, his he, he started to slide. He just unclipped and walked away from the crash. That's how slow it was. And one of the bikes, the F12, split. Slow speed crash. It split. The top two broke. The down two broke. Snapped in half. And when you look at the crash, it was nothing. So if you got a carbon bike, get some insurance. You know, that's why all my bikes are metal. You know, get aluminum, titanium, steel, whatever, because you're going to be, I mean, it's like I pulled it up. It's like thirteen five for the one with disc, $13,000, a little fall and the bike snaps. I don't know if that's covered by warranty. You know, look into that if you're going to buy those kind of bikes. So I, it came to mind when, when Robert started to talk about that, because I don't really recommend a lot of carbon bikes for that very reason. I mean, you shouldn't be scared to use your bike, you know. <laughs> and the fall those guys have, we have worse falls than that. And for that bike to snap, the guy was frustrated. His name was Gianni Moscone. He was standing on the side of the road waiting for the team car. He had no bike to ride. And, and he, his bike had those $5,000 lightweight wheels. It's a brand from Germany. So they decked that thing out. And I don't know what they're doing with those frames to where they, I guess they're lightening them up or whatever. They're going to have to make them stronger because that's just ridiculous. You can get hurt just by the thing snapping like that. So it's kind of funny. <clears throat> Cal's asking what I'm getting. No, I'm not getting a city bike. I, I will probably get either a mountain bike that I can use in for multiple uses down the road, but not right now. <clears throat> yeah, I had mentioned a while back that I was going to get a city bike. <clears throat> right.
Robert says, on the tour, they were talking a lot about crosswinds. What's the thing with crosswinds? That's a good question. Yeah, um, I don't know who's been, if you guys have been keeping up. Yesterday, uh, yesterday was the rest day. So on Monday, they had a flat stage and you had crosswind. Crosswinds, if the road is like this, the wind's blowing like this. And you have to use echelon to make progress and save your energy. And what happens is what happened on Monday, even though it was a flat stage, some of the, the guys like Thibaut Pino, there was a guy named George Bennett, they relaxed too much. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Rigoberto Uran, all of them. They lost minutes on a flat stage. That never happens because they weren't paying attention. And what happened is EF Education First went to the front and started to go hard. In the crosswind, when somebody's going fast, I don't care how strong you are. If you got a bunch of riders in an echelon where they're protected by the wind, because only one guy's fighting the wind, and when he pulls off the next rider, I've talked about echelons on here. If you are not in that echelon, you need to either start your own echelon or you will get dropped because it will take a tremendous amount of energy to be able to, you can't bridge up once they get a gap. And that's what happened. They pulled away. So Team Ineos was there. And uh, let's see, the, the yellow jersey, a la Philippe, Sagan, and all those guys, Quintana, and uh, what's his name? The world champion, Alejandro Valverde. They were attentive. So they, they took the opportunity to realize these guys. So even George Bennett, he was in fourth place, went back to the team car for bottles for his teammates. That made no sense. You shouldn't be doing water duty. You should be close to the the mean guys in the tour. He went back to get bottles. Those guys poured it on and they put minutes into them. As a result, Garen Thomas now is in second place and his teammate, I think is third. They were like 10th or something like that. Thibaut Pino lost like eight or nine places. I mean, the whole classification other than Philippe, who was paying attention. So the crosswinds create difficulty. It's the same thing when you ride in the wind creates, it's like you're climbing. If you are not in shelter and somebody gets a gap and they have people to help them, because they only work when they're at the front and then they rotate. So what ends up happening is you got one rider here, the wind's coming from this side, another rider's here. So they're staggered. That's why they call it an echelon. They're spread out across the road. When it's done right, you can see several echelons because once the road fills up, you start a new one. Well, what happened is they had one big echelon in a gap to the rest of the guys who weren't paying attention. So you had three, the peloton split in three for the end of the, uh, the stage on Monday. I believe it was stage 10, yeah. And so they lost a lot of time. So echelons are critical. Just like they talk about mountains, you can gain time. Echelons, it's, it's on a flat road, doesn't matter. That wind, the crosswind creates difficulty. So you have to be attentive. And you have to make sure you're in the front so you can get in the first echelon. Because if the stronger guys are in the first echelon, even if you start your own, they will still pull away. Because that's where the horsepower is. So, yeah, so wind is a factor. And that's why they're talking about it a lot. Because it, it costs people to lose time. So some people that were hopefully trying to compete for GC, they have lost the opportunity. Because they're not going to gain a minute on these guys in the mountains. You know, you're not supposed to lose time like that on a flat road, and they did. So that's why you got to be careful with that. <clears throat> Bonfire Gaming. Yeah, I watch the tour. I, I record the tour, and I, I play it back so I can speed it up. I don't waste my time on commercials. I speed it up. <clears throat> So Human TV says, just saw your Bell Zephyr Rude helmet review. YouTube hint me on you being live. Are you still using a helmet? Yeah, I have. Actually, I liked it so much I bought two. And the reason I bought two is that Bell discontinued it. I like the Zephyr more than the one that it replaced it with, which is heavier. And so I sourced it from uh, some store in the UK. It's hard to find now. So I got one in the colorway blue and white. I believe that's the one I did the review with. And then I got one with black and like a, 
it's hard to describe, almost like an orange red, which matches our team kit. So the helmet goes with, with our team kit really well, the Velo Harmony team kit. So yes, I wear that a lot. It's, if you watch the group rides, I guess you're new to the channel. I, we load group rides every Monday from Saturday. That's that's what I'm wearing. I use that a lot. I like it because it's perfect for my weather here. It's very humid right now and it's hot. It's 93 Fahrenheit on the thermometer. It's 103 on the road on tarmac. It's always hotter because of the road. The road, you know, radiates more heat. So you're riding 103. So, you know, when I ride, most of the time I carry three bottles full of ice and water, and then I have uh, electrolyte. So I make one stop, depending on the length of the ride. If it's a short ride, I don't need to stop. But I carry three bottles this time of year. On the weekends, I only carry two because I carry the gimbal in my middle pocket. But during the week, I carry three bottles because I like to do my workout quickly without stopping. Yeah, so it's very hot right now and humid down here. And I think 93 is like uh, 33 or 34 Celsius. It, it's hot. And it just feels hotter with the road, you know. And so every afternoon, uh, lately, we've been having thunderstorms. That's what's brewing right now, you know, which is good. And, you know, but then after that, it, it warms. It's like a steam bath, you know. So he said, uh, let's see here. I'm looking to buy a high-end helmet right now. There's a, there's a lot of helmets. I've done a review. If you look at look in the Velo Harmony Reviews playlist, I did a review, I think, of the Giro Synth also. That's another helmet I have. I have a black copy of that. I like that. Um, a lot of the helmets are pretty good. It's just a matter of what you prefer. Cost makes really good helmets, too, you know. I, this time of year, I don't wear aero helmet. I only wear the ones that have the most vents because it's just so hot that you need ventilation. So in the winter, yeah, I'll use an aero helmet because it keeps you a little warmer, has fewer vents. No, no I mean, um, so when I'm done with this tonight, I'm going to watch the tour from this morning. I recorded it but I've been busy all day. And that's why I record it because they play it live in the morning. And if you watch it live, you're just sitting there through those commercials. They seem to run them so frequently. So when I replay it, I don't deal with commercials. I speed it up because you see the images because you know the DVR lets you just move the frames. And so you can just pick the frame. I really like that. You just go straight to that frame and start it from there. And uh, that that speeds it. It cuts it. At least a third of the thing is commercials. So I like that. <clears throat> yeah, Adam Mill says, "Poor Bennett." Um, these guys, these guys are paid to ride bikes. It's kind of like if you're a painter, okay? You should know paint. You should know paint. These guys are riding bikes. You're in the Tour de France. You're not in a little weekend race. This is a big race. Bennett was in fourth place. So why is he going to get bottles? Then they talked to his team director, the NBC guys, uh, on Monday. His team director told him not to go get water for those guys. He ignored that and went. And now he lost a ton of time. So as far as the team is concerned, you, you jeopardize something. It's a big deal. Even if you don't win the Tour de France to be in the top five or he was in fourth place or the top 10 or whatever, that's a big deal. So how do you go get water for your teammates? I mean, you're not doing domestic duties. You're the GC guy, you know? So I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they're going to, you know, talk to him about it later because that, that was just, you know, especially it's kind of like going to work. Your boss tells you not to do something and then you do it and then, it, it has negative results, you're at fault. So the fact that they told him, don't go back to get water, and he did. I, what kind of thinking is that? You're supposed to be near the other GC guys. You know, Even Quintana, who was further down on the classification, was up front. So he gained time because he hasn't been riding that great so far. But he gained time because he was smart. He was up there. Sagan was up there. That's where you're supposed to be. If you have GC aspirations, you don't go to the back. 
even though the race was not on at that moment, it can go on anytime and it can happen. You know, you, you, you never know. So you go to the back, you have a puncture, then what? So I, you know, I he needs to pay attention. You know, he, he's he was riding great, he's real strong, you know. So it's unfortunate because you see what happened to Chris Froome. He spent a whole year getting ready for this and then he crashed or whatever. Anything can happen. So when you get an opportunity in the tour, you don't mess it up for something foolish like that. You know, I mean, somebody else on the team can go get water for those guys. So, and then the funny thing about it is he goes to get water and his teammate, uh, what's his name? I think I think he's uh, on uh, Yumbo, uh, I think that, 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 that Yumbo team. I think his teammate, uh, Watt Van, Van Art, won the race because he was up there. That's where he should have been. You know, because nobody's gonna get out of an echelon to come get you after that, and it, it just, it's hard. Once they're up the road, unless you get some really strong guys, it's hard to make up time in the wind. And those guys were pouring it on; they were going full gas. Once they realized they had Tibo Pino and all those guys back there who had been in the top positions, they all lost time. They gained time on them. You know, so you got all, and and it, it's not like those guys had a mechanical and then they decided to do it. No. Everybody's racing and you messing around in the back. So, yeah, so he needs to pay more attention. Prince Moransky said, I just bought a bike, a Fuji Sportive. The wheels are heavy, three kilogram. Should I upgrade to light, adjust train on these until I get fast? Um, just train on them. I, I train on very heavy wheels because I think it makes you stronger anyway. You're working harder. You know, that's really one of the most important things. Um um, if you're now, let's say you, you just got the bike and you're riding and then you want to start doing some group rides or whatever, then yeah, you can get, you can get another set of wheels. And when it's time to do your group ride, you just swap those wheels out, get a set of wheels with the same, you, you don't have to get a cassette for your grupo. So you can just swap it. Everybody needs a spare set of wheels anyway, but you want to train on your, the, the sturdiest wheels you have for your everyday training. And then when you have a Grand Fondo or a group ride, you put the lighter wheels on there and then you go do the group ride. You will feel the difference. But yeah, don't train on lightweight stuff. I see people training on carbon wheels all the time. The top, Even the pros don't train on carbon wheels. In the winter, when they're not with their teams, they train on regular we- aluminum wheels. They train on bigger tires because they, they have less puncture, you know, and it's rainy and stuff like that. Those guys, they don't want to be messing with you. They just want to ride because it doesn't matter. When you're training, it's not like you're trying to get some kind of time that you care about. You're just training. And so I use heavier tires when I train, and I use heavier wheels when I train. So I use a lot. I, I ride 28s, and, and it's not like uh, I don't, it's not even the 4,000 Continental 4,000. I use uh, like a Continental Ultra Sport. Or the uh, Gator Skin. That's what I train on. They're heavier compound tire. I can still ride in a group ride with it. And sometimes I do that on purpose. I'll go like the last time I was talking about it, where I said I make my bike heavier. So when I take the Colnago, I'll put heavy wheels on it and go and ride with those guys so I can get a workout at a slower, if they're going slower, at that slower pace. So, yes, don't be in a rush to go buy wheels. You just got the bike, enjoy it. Uh, but, yes, the first thing you can do, the, the, the bang for the buck, is to get a set of wheels on your bike. But then just use that for your faster rides, you know, and then you swap back. That's what everybody does. Nobody, serious riders don't train on their best wheels. They save it for rides that mean something to them. Because actually, I want to train on sturdier stuff. I don't want mechanicals when I'm training. I don't have a whole lot of time. If I got two hours to ride, I want to be riding, not repairing something. So I have heavy compound tires, you know, (laughs) just sturdy stuff. 
when I go to train. <laughs> and, and I mean, I don't change the way I ride. I still look for, you know, smooth pavement and the cleanest spots to ride. But still, I use heavier stuff to train. I'm not alone in that. You, you hear some riders say I got they got a rain bike or whatever. Like when it rains, they got a bike they use for that. So, yes, save your best stuff for the rides that mean so that it's, it's in great condition. I'm not saying never ride them. You have to make sure they're, they're functioning good to test. But for everyday training, you need to have a training set of wheels. You can use the same frame. Just swap out the wheels. So put that on your list to just get a nice set of wheels that you can afford. Uh, you know, the wheels I have that I ride that, are, that I consider an upgrade, they are they have aluminum braking surface, but they're carbon and aluminum combination because I can't stand the braking on the carbon. Plus, you got to use special brake pads. I don't like when I swap my wheels to mess with the brakes. I just want to swap the wheels and go. And that's why I'm glad Shimano made that. So I ended up using a Shimano wheel on my camping setup. You know, so let's see here. Cal's Cycling says, what are your opinions on the new bike? Uh, those of you, if I don't get to your to your question, because there are a lot of questions here, uh, make sure you consider using a super chat because I'm looking for our super legends and our, our patrons for the most part. All right. So let's see here. Cal Cycling said, what are your opinions on new bikes looking similar to one another? That's boring. <laughs> you know. Who wants a bike that, if you take the name off, they all look the same? You know, they can't come up with anything more. Yeah, I, I wouldn't buy one of those. I, I don't. I like distinctive stuff. I like a bike that, if there's no name on it, you still know what that is. Because all of them are looking like each other. Someone mentioned it, I think, at the last session, because I looked it up. And yeah, for what we're paying, I already talked about these carbon bikes. I was talking about the, the Tour de France Stage 8. If you didn't see it, you can go online. In fact, here's the link. Those of you who have carbon bikes, you might want to consider getting some kind of insurance. They have insurance companies that will insure your bicycle because on a slow speed crash on stage eight in the city, uh, uh, what's this guy? The guy was riding for EF Education First. His wheel slid. And what he did was he just, hey, Robert, thanks for the super chat. It was a slow. It was slow enough to where one of the Indios guys just unclipped and walked away from his bike. He didn't even fall. That's how slow it was. Well, this one guy on a thirteen thousand dollar bike, Gianni Muscon, one of the team Indios guys, his bike snapped, top tube and down. The bike cut in half. And when you when you look at the crash, there was nothing that crazy about it. The, the, he didn't even have road rash on him. He's standing on the side of the road waiting, and uh, they talked about it. But I saw that I was like, for thirteen grand, that's that's it. So I don't know if the warranty covers those things because the bikes are so overpriced, and then they're snapping. You know, when I race, you've got a, a wreck, you just get up, get on your bike, straighten the bars, and go. <laughs> you know, because it was steel. You know, uh, these carbon bikes here is like a bunch of babies. You know. So the guy couldn't even ride. He had to wait because they were in the front. He had to wait for the team car to come. And this was just a few days ago. This is probably over the weekend. And they they, they wrote about it. It's a bunch of articles about it. It's, it's the F12, Pinarello F12, the latest and greatest. So they're lightening up those things and selling them for fourteen, thirteen thousand dollars. And when you fall, pow! What is that? I mean, gosh, they need to make them tougher. So no. I just uh, so I'm, I you know so if you're gonna buy a carbon bike, get some insurance because uh, the fall that they had, I I've had worse. <laughs> so that was nothing major. Hey Tom, Tom Nix is here from Austria. Welcome. So just just be careful with that and insure your bike because uh, and in fact sometimes when you fall, they tell you to get the bike. They have people that do ultrasound on the carbon to make sure there's no fractures that you can't see. That's another thing about carbon, you know, so. <clears throat> Roman Rodriguez, I live Southeast Houston. Southeast Houston, okay, yeah, that's, um, what are the best places to ride in Houston and surrounding areas? 
Well, you need to ride the area you live in. You always want to ride near where you are. You can ride anywhere in Houston. Southeast Houston, I don't know exactly where you are, but I used to be, I used to live in Clare Lake City, NASA Road, one area. You probably know the area if you're in South Southeast uh, Houston. And I used to ride with the Wolfpack Cycling Club. So, we, you know, there are roads there you can use. Sometimes we use part of the route. We use the feeder or we'll go on 512. There's a lot of roads out there. There's a guy on the channel here that lives out there. His name is Troy, Troy Serrano. He rides out there. You can ride, uh, I think, Dickinson. So the... What you want to start with is go to your local bike shop where you live. They know where the riders ride if you're not doing group rides. Because when the group rides, you can kind of get an idea of where the group goes. But start with the bike shop, and they will recommend some routes. You can ride anywhere. You don't need to go anywhere special. You can ride out of your door and just go. The road's near your house. Your, your bike is a vehicle. Just head out. But I know what you're looking for. You want quiet roads that will give you a good workout. That's why I said talk to the guys at the bike shop. Um, I don't know if they still sell those books, but a long time ago, I bought a book that said Bicycling in the Houston Area. And for each part of Houston, it's a yellow book. It was like nine bucks in the bike shop. Each area of town, they had recommended routes. So start with your bike shop because they know where they'll recommend you go. That, and that's anywhere you go. Any city you go to, always start with a local bike shop. Talk to them. They'll tell you where people ride. But you don't feel like you have to put your bike in a car to go ride. I hate doing that. If I'm going to an event, that's the only time I put my bike in a car. I just ride out the door and go. The roads is for the bike. It's a road bike. Use it. I don't care how busy it is. You are a vehicle. If you know how to drive your car, treat your bike the same way, get out there and go. You know, it's not that crazy. I've ridden in, in the city of Houston. You can ride anywhere. It's the people like today I was coming back, some guy riding the opposite side of the road. He was in my way. I was more wide. So I did like this, you know, just on Sterling Ridge in the woodland. I did like this. And he said, ah, no, no, I'm just going to, I don't care if you're only going a thousand yards, you, you're riding on the wrong side of the road. If you have a wreck, you're at fault. End of story. You know, that's why he doesn't understand. Because when those cars come to the intersection, they don't expect you there. If you're riding against the flow, they're not looking there for you. No driver is looking for a cyclist coming at him. They're looking for traffic coming the proper way. So when a driver comes to an intersection, they look, I look like this for traffic. If you're coming this way, I'm turning into you because you're not supposed to be there. And then you're at fault. So he, he was like, he was all decked out and, and riding illegally because it is against the law. And I, you know, the cops are not going to stop you on a bicycle for the most part, unless there's a problem. But it's still, it's illegal to ride against the flow of traffic because you're a hazard, like what I just described. You're a hazard to every other road user. Because when a driver pulls up on this side of the pond anyway, even in the UK, they drive on the other side, on the right, on the left. But uh, they're, they're going to be doing the same thing. They're going to look the direction they expect traffic to come from. They're not going to be looking here. So if I look and it's clear and I turn and you're coming, bam. You're at fault. So it's very dangerous to ride against traffic. I see a lot of people doing it in where I live. Adults that don't know what the heck they're doing. They're on cruisers, and they think it's safe. Right on the wrong side. So when they get to an intersection now, they have to stop and wait for every other road user to go. Because, you know, they don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, It's a lot simpler riding your bike just like you drive your car. You don't have to think about it. And then all the other people didn't know what you are going to do. So I tried to warn that guy, but he was like jabbering. I just ignored him. I just moved over away from him. I used up the whole lane. You know, he was riding on the little edge that we you guys see in our film. In the woodlands, they have the little edge. He was going against the traffic there. And what he doesn't understand is every corner, when somebody comes out, you're at risk. So when you're riding against traffic, think about the stress. You're riding against traffic. You got to worry about everybody pulling out because they're not looking for you. They're looking the other way. <laughs> so I don't know why they do that. You know, I got my, my seven and my nine year old. They, they can ride on uh, in the neighborhood here. No problems because now they, they're comfortable interacting with the other road because that's how I, I, I taught them. All right, we got a super chat. Thank you, John Hill. Thank you. Appreciate that, man. 
My brother's here. Hey, Paul Ilonga is here. Yeah, so I don't know how I got on that tangent, but the guy in Southeast Texas, just go out your door, man. Find a quiet area to start with until you can get to the bike shop. Don't feel like you got to go anywhere. Find a quiet road because I know you're looking for a place where it's not congested, where you're stopping all the time. But you sometimes you got to deal with that to get to a quiet road. So you start with the bike shop. They'll tell you where, where everybody rides. And as you get out there, you will find other roads that are quiet. That's what I do. On my slow days, I, I try. Even Robert Tangler mentioned that he thanked me for the stuff I load on Strava. And when I was doing the uh, Festive 500, I loaded all my rides. And he found like La Paloma and a lot of little roads that are here that normally you have no reason to go down. And that's what I do on my Friday ride or Monday if I'm just loosening up. I go areas where I don't normally ride. And you find new areas to ride in within the same place you go all the time because there are a lot of different roads. So just get out in your neighborhood in Southeast Texas and start with those neighborhood roads and, and get to see your neighbors because a lot of people in the U.S. don't know their neighbors because everybody drives in the U.S. into the garage and puts the door down. We don't get to see our neighbors very much. So get on your bike and get out there and just explore. Southeast Texas has a lot of good, quiet roads, farm to market roads. You, you'll have fun out there. Every now and then you'll get somebody yelling at you because there's a bunch of idiots. You know, we have village idiots all over the place, but don't let that stop you. <laughs> all right, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> so Adam Mill said he trains on Dura Ace 9100 with 25 millimeter tires. Heavy, I could put my heavier giant wheels on. Um, it's it's. I mean, whether it's 25 millimeter, 23 millimeter. I mean, the point I was trying to make for the other gentleman that asked about whether he should buy a wheel, you know, because he's got heavy wheels on the bike. Heavy wheels are actually good. It's more resistance. You will work harder. So if you train on heavier wheels, switch them out, put your lighter wheels, go for the weekend ride, good performance. So that's one way you can make yourself work harder. You know, um, I may make a video about that. But, yeah, that, that's that, that's a number. That's a number one thing that I think a lot of people ignore. And so a lot of times when I will ride with Team RR, I'll take my called Nago and make sure I've got the 28s on there or whatever. They're not. That much heavier, but they're not as, as light or fast as the Victorias and the other stuff. You don't want to ride on very expensive tires every day. It's just not practical. It's kind of like wearing a, your suit to work in the yard. So for just training, get the get the low TPI tires and then sturdier wheels or whatever. Don't, don't train on fancy carbon wheels. I mean, if that's all you have, then fine. But if you have heavier wheels like Adam mentioned, Train on those, especially if it's wet or whatever. Don't take your carbon wheels out in the wet. Put your heavier wheels on, ride on that. And then for the faster the rides that mean something to you, you just switch them out. It's not a big deal. You know, everybody does that. Everybody has wheels hanging up for rides or grand funders, and they switch them out. That's the way you do it. And if you have multiple bikes, a lot of people will just have a bike set up with the wheels that they care about, and they just leave that bike set up, and then they train on another bike, you know. I think every cyclist should have at least two bikes because if one is in the shop because of a mechanical, you can stick with your program. I mean, if you're serious about it, you know, regardless, I mean, you don't have to be a racer to be serious about it. What I mean is whatever your goal is, you know, as far as a health thing, being fit, you know, low blood pressure, you want to keep your blood pressure down or whatever you, your reason for being in it. That's what I mean when I say we train, we don't ride. You need to have a goal. Whatever your goal is, you train for that goal. So you would do specific rides for your goal versus the other guy. You don't need to do sprints if you're just trying to get cardio work done at this point. And then later on, you can probably get into that. So that's what I mean. You have to have goals. You know, Rolando Garcia, Bloomington, California. Interesting. Well, I got a super chat here. You guys, I tell you. Edgar Cole, I got to jump to the super chat here. Edgar, thanks for the super chat. He says, uh, hello, Elder. Just wanted to say hello from San Diego, California. Beautiful city. As usual, the conversation is quite compelling. If I have anything to add, I will jump in. 
Feel free, Edgar. Thanks for the super chat. It means a lot. The super chats, my super legends, patrons, enable me to divest my time from other stuff and do this. Let me let me be straight. I love doing this. I'm sure you can tell. You feel my energy. But love alone is not enough. And Robert Tangler, Edgar, and these guys understand that. And there's another guy named Ian. Of course, John Hill always pops in here with super chats. But a lot of people understand that. So that's fine. I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm glad that they contribute. So I'm able to continue doing this because I really enjoy. When I was starting out in cycling, I didn't have this resource. So I stumbled around a lot. And a lot of people will look at you fall and they won't say, oh, you know, you, you, you're doing that wrong or whatever. Because a lot of people don't want you to get as good as they are. I'm sure you guys run into that. You go to a group ride. Somebody looks at you funny, but they don't really say anything. And so even if you're doing it wrong, they don't point anything out, but they want to give you attitude. I think that's pretty short-sighted. You don't grow cycling by keeping people out. So that's that's another reason I do this. But I do specify that when I go on rides, I don't say anything to somebody unless they open the door, either by making a comment or asking me a question that is an opener, and then I'll because you have to give people information when they're ready to receive it. So when I go on group rides, I don't bother people. I just ride, you know, until they start it and they're seeking out information. And then I'll, I'll let them know because we've done it. Paul spent a whole break one time instead of going to get his drinks and whatever, telling some guy, need. I'm not going to call the name. He knows who I'm talking about. You need a fit. The guy's complaining about discomfort and Paul's telling him you need a fit. He, he's, he's, he's like, I need a new bike. A new bike is not going to solve the problem you're having with this bike. There's nothing wrong with the bike he had. He just never got a fit. And he's never done a fit, you know. So even now, even after, so you can give people information. They don't act on it if they're not ready to receive it. And that, that's the point I'm trying to make. So I really like that I'm able to do this. And I, that's, that's one thing unique about this channel. I get a lot of people sending me messages from the website because they'll watch these. You know, we've got a lot of videos now, 500 or something. They'll watch the videos and they'll have questions. And what I try to explain to them is it's not possible for me to answer all these questions. I get a lot of questions. There's a lot of people on this channel. And some people don't subscribe, but they still have questions. And I tell them, you have to sign up for the cycling consultation so you can pay me for my time because I have to use my time to help you. And some people do, but some people have this attitude like, why should I have to pay? Well, that's like telling me my time means nothing. I, I, you know, I don't take it personally. I'm like, well, sorry. You know? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I don't know how I got on that. Let's get back here. Let's talk about cycling here. But I just want to explain that. I, I love that. I love doing what I do. You know, And so it means a lot to me when you guys do these super chats, especially the patrons. You know, That enables me to do stuff. And I try to bring reviews and different things. I got another review coming out. This week, I'm trying to bring different things, not just Rafa stuff, you know. So we're trying to, that's why I did the La Passion. I got another La Passion review coming out. I think you guys will like. Let's see here. Uh, John Wesley. I haven't seen this guy in a while. At Tuscacita Huffman Crosby is an awesome area to ride. Wide open, flat roads forever. Yeah, uh, John, I, I mean, I see what you're doing, but I don't want this guy to drive from. So, you know, John, John, you're here. So you obviously know the area. You don't want this guy to drive from Southeast Texas to Atascacita. It's not in his area. So what I told him was he can ride there. Because I used to ride in Southeast Texas. There's, there's a lot of roads there. That's a 512 highway somewhere near Dickinson and stuff. We used to ride out there. I don't remember all the roads. But I want him to know he's got nice flat roads. He's got rollers. Not everything down there is flat. So he's got options. He's just not familiar with it. That's, that's what I meant. I don't want him putting his bike in a car to drive to North Houston to go ride. It's not practical. And he won't be able to stick with it. It's too much of an investment in time. It's a lot easier to just roll out your door, and then you'll be able to do a 30-minute ride every day. Because it's better to do short rides often. You know, all of us press for time. It's better to do 30 minutes than none at all. Let's put it that way. So if you just got a few minutes, head out the door. Go visit, spin around the neighborhood. We do that. Sometimes I'll just spin in my neighborhood on North Crest. We got a 20 mile an hour street. So I just take the right lane. We got two lanes and a boulevard, you know, middle thing. So I take the right lane, just go up and down if I don't have too much time. You can do that. 
So I wanted him to just kind of be able to, something he can keep up with. And then he could do group rides and stuff in other areas, you know. So, yeah, I didn't want him to depend on the car. Let's see here. Ian Hunter, welcome. He says, uh, hi, Eldred. I've been looking at the Colnago C64 frames. Do you have any views on the C64? They're nice. Uh, I, I guess you, I think you just got here before I talked about my <laughs> stage eight of the Tour de France. <laughs> Carbon frame. Pow! 13,000 plus dollars gone. So doesn't mean uh, they're bad, but what I'm saying, is it was a slow speed crash. I watched it. It was so slow. One of the guys, and I've, I've said this before, but I'm saying this for Ian Hunter, who's one of our supporters here, just got here. One of the guys on the Ineos team, the, this, this crash was so slow, he unclipped and walked away from his bike. That's how slow it was. They basically saw it happen because the EF guy fell in front of them. So uh, uh, a, a crash with nothing going on, maybe 10 kilometers an hour, and the frame snaps in half, top tube and down tube. Moscone was standing by the side of the road, Gianni Moscone, waiting. His bike snapped in half. The rest of the guys, the, the, I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kwiatkowski helped uh, Garen Thomas get the chain back on his bike. You know, it's one of those, it happens to us. I mean, I have worse crashes than they had. Because they were slowing down, they were coming into town, and it was slowing down. And it was a slow, and, and there must have been dirt on the road because the guy just slid out in front of them. So they saw it. This other guy just unclipped, walked away from the crash. Moscone didn't even have any road rash, nothing, but his bike snapped in half. So I'm like, okay, that's a lot of money to pay for that. So if you're gonna get a, a carbon frame, get some insurance for your bike because I don't think warranty will cover that. That that was that was the point I was making. C64, you can't go wrong with that. It makes some nice bikes. Uh, there's a guy that rides with Mo. What's his name? Um, Fabian. He has a called Nago. And he has two of those Pinarellos, the one I'm talking about. He's got the F12 as well in the Ineos team colors. He got one as well. So uh, the next time I see him, I would mention, I hope you got insurance on that thing. Because it just snapped. And the tubes, you know, they, they've, they've got the cables routed inside. And all, all I was holding them together were the cables that were inside. But that's that's a big investment for us. We don't buy frames all the time. You know, those guys, they're going to send it back to the factory or whatever they do. But for us, man, that's a big deal. You go on a ride and your bike snaps in half. I mean, come on. So, yeah. So get some insurance on your bike because I don't think that uh, bikes, you know, that's, that's why I spend my money on metal bikes. <laughs> you know, so I've had carbon frames. I didn't mean that's going to happen to you, but it can happen. And even if that doesn't happen, whenever you crash a carbon frame, you it is recommended that you get it inspected by a carbon expert that will use ultrasound to make sure there's no fractures that you can't see in there. Because carbon can be repaired. So, you know, it's not the end of the world. Alan had a crash years ago. He rides with us from time to time. His handlebars hit the, you know, when you fall, it snapped and just hit the top tube, and it broke the top tube, and he just they took the bike apart, shipped it to Calfee. Calfee is one of the manufacturers I'm aware of that will repair any carbon bike in the U.S. Doesn't matter where you bought it from because they make their own, but they repair anything. They repaired it, it came back, you couldn't even tell. Did the paint and everything. Prince Moransky, thanks for the super chat, my brother. Appreciate that. So just keep that in mind. There's a company called Velo, Velo Insurance. I have no affiliated with them, affiliation with them. I just know. Velo Insurance, they, they're cyclists, and they sell insurance to cover your bike. And the reason I'm mentioning them is they're not the only one, but you want cycling-specific insurance so that they understand you know, the value of the bike or whatever. And I don't know if the regular insurance companies will be up to you know, covering a 13, it may, you know, it's been a while, I mean, you know, but just make sure you got something on your, you, you might be able to add it to your homeowners or something like that, but get something if you get a carbon bike, just in case. So you're not out all that, that, all that money if something happens, you know, and it doesn't have to snap for you to claim the insurance. Any crash that's significant, get it inspected because you may have to replace it if there's fractures in it. 
That's the only thing about carbon. So yeah, start with that. Uh, but uh, what's in the end? You you need to make sure you got your size right for that frame set. Uh, for any frame set you buy, if you already know your size, because they use stack height, and I believe they have the sloping type. To it's not too bad, but you need to get the correct size, and so you don't get a frame that's too big or too small for you. But, but they make they make nice nice frames. All right, let's see here. Uh, you're welcome, Roman. Roman is thanking me for me answering his question. Uh, John West is a few elite groups available. Yeah, um, John John had mentioned that that guy could ride in Atascacita and so forth. I don't know his level, John, so I don't like to push people towards groups that are too fast so they don't get their morale hurt. <laughs> You know, so that's that's the key. But I think he just wants to find and find roads where he lives. Cause I think he's he might be he said he's new. He just got a bike or whatever. So yeah, just want to get familiar with some routes. But yeah, he, if he starts with a bike shot, he should be good. So let's see here. C Kula John. He says Spinergy makes an affordable carbon wheel set. Yeah, he's recommending wheel sets for people. Um, there was somebody, I think the reason for that is there was somebody who said they just got a bike and they were thinking about it because they got heavy wheels on it. You don't need, there's no rush. You can start with your wheels. As long as you're not doing any major climbs, if you're just rolling, you will be okay. Yeah, you have to work a little harder, but it will get your engine ready so that when you get the new wheels, you'll be flying. <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, see, cool. I've been missing Paul and his camera skills on the group. Yeah, uh, we, uh, Paul, Paul's been, what happened is the week before, Paul had to go out of town. So I filmed. Yeah, that's why I, I took the camera on the ride that I just loaded. That was 7 6. Then a week after that, I went on vacation and my wife messed up my plans because we were supposed to come back early Friday. We didn't come back early Friday. We came back late Friday. And so, to get up at five in the morning, go do a ride after I'd been off the whole week. It just wasn't practical. I was just tired. And so I didn't ride that Saturday. That's why I, I loaded the ride prior to the vacation. So this weekend we'll be out there riding. Yeah. So we just had some logistical issues and, you know, life just popped up, different things going on. That's why you haven't seen Paul. But, but a couple of weeks ago, Paul filmed. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Yeah, so let's see here. Ken Castro from New England, Patriot Country. Welcome. True this, John Weekly. I agree. The uh, you ever wonder why they call that place New England? I guess it's New England. I think that's what they meant, literally. I've always wondered. I don't know. It just came up since I always wondered why. Why was it? Why is it named? Why is it called? <laughs> so it is New England, kind of like New Orleans. I'm sure they had a because the French were there. Why is it called New England? So on May 19, 1643, the colonies of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, New Haven, and Connecticut joined together in a loose compact called the New England Confederation officially the United Colonies of New England. So the New England colonies were settled primarily by farmers who became relatively self-sufficient. Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I've always wondered why it was called that. Makes sense. Ian, you're welcome. Ian is thanking me for the information. Yeah, you can't go wrong. If you already know your, your, your size, then I would suggest, I don't know what your plan is in getting the bike. If you can, the way I would do it, I mean, I can build my own bikes up, but you may not be able to. What you could consider doing if you know your size is ordering the frame set and then paying your local shop because they charge maybe 75 pounds, thereabouts, maybe about $100 or so to put a, 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 a to build a bike. The bike shop's here. It might be $100, $150. It might be like 80 pounds. Um, and so 
that that might be a route where you could source your own components if you're comfortable with that and cut out the middleman. It keeps your cost down tremendously than buying a full bike. So you could buy the frame set, get the components, let your shop put it together. <laughs> you see, you will save quite a bit. <laughs> John Wesley, hey, Ken, got a ride for you from New England to Houston. Bring AC with you. <laughs> yeah, Houston is uh, muggy. Um, I went out this morning, and before I even left the house, the windows are, you know, the condensations on the windows so you know what you're in for. Ah, thank you, my brother. DD, thank you for the super chat. What happens is this. I don't keep the AC downstairs. In fact, the AC unit downstairs quit because we we have a the, the house has four AC units when they built it. You know, we found the house in 2012. And one of the units is a bit redundant because even though it's there, it's just for a small area where the, the studio is and so forth. But then the bigger units, when you run them, it cools the whole area anyway. So that unit wasn't working. So when it started to mess up, because it's, it's an old unit. The house was built, I think, 1988 or something like that. So it's probably 30 some years old. And everybody you call to work on a unit, they want you to buy a whole new unit as opposed to just fixing the evaporator coil or something. That's a, I guess it's an American thing. We don't like to repair anymore. Everybody wants to replace, you know. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm like, you know, I'm not ready to buy a whole new unit. This just... The coil is leaking or whatever. And so the guy comes in and he's like, you know, he, he he gives a bid. And then the next guy comes, you get these bids. And they're just crazy. They come in and see, oh, well, I think that, uh, the, the handymen in the U.S. And those of you who are here probably have the same experience. They come and they look at your address. They look at you. And then they give you a price. They don't have a price list. They create a price for each place they show up. <laughs> I mean, you can see them sizing you up. I'm like, you know. <laughs> so you can never get a price from them on the phone. They got to come see what neighborhood you're in. How big is the house? Do you look like you can afford this? And then they come up with a price. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm going through to try to get it. So as a result, it's 75 degrees downstairs where the studio is where I keep the bike, which is fine. It's perfect. I don't like it very cold because you're going to go outside anyway. So you don't want to be in 68 or whatever. Some people, I, I never keep the AC. I never go below 70. It's like 73 to 75. Don't keep your AC too cold if you're going to be working out in the, in the heat, especially during the week when you're at work. If you're in AC all the time, it's hard to get acclimated. I used to like sometimes when the car is moving, I would put the windows down, I mean, you know, it's not super comfortable. That when you're sitting in traffic, if you're moving, just to get used to being out of the office and getting used to that heat, especially if I'm going to a ride after work or something in the afternoon, you want to get used to that heat. But make sure you drink more than you than you think you need. You know, when there's a when there's a doubt, just have some extra water, especially with ice. You know, so today I was on my way back. There was a store my brother and I go to. It's called Valero, our favorite store. He knows what I'm talking about. Another super chat. Ian, thank you, my brother. Uh, the, the Valero, what happened is we, we stopped there because it's clean. It's it's on the outskirts of the woodlands. Very clean. The stores that we go to, they don't have the bathroom not clean. We don't we don't visit them. So we have stores. We plan our rides that we're going to stop there. So I'm coming back, and I stopped at the Valero. So I walk in, the guy's mopping, and you know, we got cleats on. So of course I slow down. The Shimano cleats got the little rubber things. So I'm walking very gingerly. So the guy stops, he's mopping, he stops and he looks at me. And I said, yeah, I got plastic under these shoes. Cause you know, I was walking just very careful cause I didn't want to slip. I thought I got plastic under these shoes. So he started to laugh. So I walk over to the machine. I have my bottles, I had three bottles. I get ice, water, and then I just start to leave. And he's like, you're not buying anything? So I turned to him. I said, I'm here all the time and I buy stuff all the time. So maybe you should just keep me on film. <laughs> he said, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know? I was like, whatever. So no, I didn't buy anything because it's one of the few places that have water at the, the dispenser where they have all the soda. They have a, a, a little tab that you push to get water on the lemonade one. 
and then they have ice. So I just get ice, get water. I don't, I didn't need anything. It wasn't a very long ride because I, I head out in the morning. I already, you know, I have something to eat. And so he was just messing with me because he, he's there all the time. We stopped there often enough. And then so when I said, no, I just needed water. <laughs> he said, oh, I'm just playing with you. And then I gingerly walked out because the whole place was wet. And it's all I and I told him, I said, I don't want to fall and have to sue you because I like coming here. And he started to laugh because you want to mess with me. I mess with him too. But a lot of places will, the reason I brought that up, a lot of places will frown on you just going in there to get water or whatever because you're not buying anything. So I only do it in places that we frequent. <laughs> Places that we frequent so that, I mean, this guy knows us. We're there all the time. It's the same guy behind the, the cash register. So they don't, it's not a big deal. But some places they want to be, you know, funny about it. It's okay when you're with a bunch of cyclists and somebody's buying a bottle of water or whatever. I, I don't buy bottled bottle of water. The water out here is decent enough. I just get ice and water because most of the time I'm pouring the water on me. I'm not drinking it that much. I pour the water on me. Those of you who follow the tour, we don't have that luxury. The guys in the tour, they get a stocking thing full of ice and they put it right here under the jersey on their spine. I cannot tell you how good that must feel because when I pour water there, it's cold with the ice. It's like almost all of a sudden you're rejuvenated. That's why I carry three bottles. And even during during the Saturday rides when we ride, I only have two bottles. But when we get to the store, I drink while I'm there and then I load up both bottles before we leave. So that I can use some to pour on me. But because when you dampen your jersey and the air hits you, it's like uh it's like having a, your own little mist, you know, misting fan or something like that. You guys know what I mean. All those little things make a difference. Then you just riding in the heat is not that big a deal. Because on the bicycle, you're moving. You know, I don't know how it is when you're running. I don't know you get the same amount of wind. I know on the bike it makes a difference. That's why I love the south wind when I'm coming back. I don't mind it slowing me down cools you off. But yeah, the reason I mentioned that is it's hot. You need to do all of that. Pour water and you pour it on your head, whatever. Don't be shy. I take off my glasses. I pour it on the helmet and it just comes down and I put my glasses back on. It dries off like that. But while it's drying off, it just cools you. And you your performance stays high because your core temperature is under control. That's how I deal with the heat down here because it is very humid. And then even if it says 93, like I mentioned earlier, it might be 103 on the tarmac when you're riding. It's hotter because the road radiates all of that. So we're dealing with a lot. That's why we're leaving earlier. You know, the rides are starting like 630. That's why I've been doing Team RR because they're leaving earlier. The other guys are still leaving at 730. That hour makes a difference not being out there in that heat. So just uh, those of you who are here, whether you're in Malaysia, Thailand, wherever the humid parts of the world, that's how you do it so that you can get out there. Plus, don't go out between the hottest part. Like here is like, say, one to five. It's just too hot. So you, you either go out early or go out later in the day. After 5, 30, 6 o'clock, it's actually very pleasant here. By 7 in the evening, you know, let's say the sun is still up until like 8. 30 thereabouts. So by seven in the evening, you can head out, have a great ride. It's not that hot. You know, so that's how you have to do it. Even the lions, I was watching, uh, I don't know why I got into that. I was telling my my daughter, my 19-year-old, she was gonna go for a walk at 12:30. I'm like, you know, you should have gotten up this morning to head out. I told her, I said, even the lions sleep during the hottest part of the day. They hunt in the morning and in the evening. But <laughs> they got to figure it out. Even our squirrels out here, I don't see them out in the heat of the day. They come out early and they go out after five. So that's what you have to do. Take a siesta. You know, don't ride at noon when it's hot. You're not going to get that much of a workout. You'll be fighting the heat. Your, your, your quality of the workout will be low. And it, you just run. It's just it's just too hard on the body. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, which bike shop would you trust? Westheimer, Eldridge area. Um, I haven't used I haven't used the bike shop for so long. Um, I used to live out there. I used to live in A Leaf, if you know the area. 
I used to live where you where you listed West Westheimer Eldridge. I used to live a Derry Ashford and Westheimer about a block west of that. Uh, some apartments long time ago. I used to live out there. Uh, so whatever shops I did are probably new because the shops I knew bike shops come and go. They're kind of like restaurants. They're hard to keep open. So um, start with the chains. Now I will caution you. You know the bike barns out there. They're a little pricey. Um, I don't. I don't know any shops in that area. So if you have people that you ride with, ask your mates, see who they're using, get their feedback. You know, um, I don't know what what kind of services you need from the bike shop because if you need repairs, then you really have to go there and find out if you if you haven't talked to anybody because. It, it's only as good as the quality of the mechanic. If it's some little kid trying to learn and whatever, sometimes you take your bike in and it, I used to experience the same thing. That's why I ended up learning how to work on bikes. You leave it there for three days and you get it and it's still not right. They just, they don't test it enough. But if it's a good mechanic, then you won't have problems. So I can't recommend a bike shop on that side of town because I'm not really familiar with them. Even on my side of town, I would say the same thing because there is a mechanic on a bike shop here in the woodlands that I know. His name is Rob. We ride with, and I would recommend him, but nobody else in the shop. In fact, the guys that we, that we ride with, when they go to the shop, they tell them, I only want Rob working on my bike. <laughs> and that's kind of what you have to do wherever you take it. Now, there are a lot of shops that have very experienced mechanics staffing them. The shop that I'm familiar with is in the city. It's called West End Bicycles. That's where I go when I have something to do. Like when I was building the blue bike, I had the paint in the threads. The guy who built the bike, you know, when he painted it, didn't clean out the threads. I took my, I drove an hour there, even though I got bike shops all around here. I drove into the Heights area. You know the area, you're in Houston. I drove there because of the quality of their work. The West End Bicycles, I recommend to anybody. He's, the, the guy's been doing it for a while. He keeps quality people in there. And they really, they're so good that people ride their bikes to the place to get repairs and then ride it home. So you know you have to trust the shop. That means you know you're not going to be waiting because, you know, in the heights, people ride their bikes. So, yeah, um, you have to do some homework. It's going to be hard for me to recommend any shop because I, I don't know any shops that are there. They, they've got to be new. I've been living up that side of town for a long time. But take it with a grain of salt. Just be careful. I mean, if you don't do your own repair, um, you you want to question the shop and just say, look, I want I want to make sure the bike is right when I come to get it. I don't want to have to hassle with it after leaving it here because you're without your bike for days and then you pick it up and it's not working. Carl, I hope I pronounced that Dupuis. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Appreciate your videos, learning a lot. You're welcome, Carl. That's why we set up this channel. I'm glad that uh, I appreciate that feedback. I cannot get enough of them. That's really good uh, because I there, there's a lot of videos. We have 500 some videos out there. So what I focus on is what we talk about here, live session, questions I may get here or during the premiere. People ask questions, then you know, they ask about a jersey, I'll do that review if possible, or some topic, then I'll do. I'm trying to focus on videos I think people here want to see because I already have a lot of content on the channel and I don't want to just be making videos just for fillers. I want quality. And people had asked, people had sent me a lot of comments about the 90 RPM. They go to the website and they use the contact thing. The contact thing, it's okay. But they'll use the contact stuff and they'll ask questions. <laughs> so people, a lot of people had asked about 90 RPM. So I did the video for that. And, and it it looked like it was popular because a lot of cyclists don't really understand why, you know. And believe it or not, some experienced cyclists, you know, I showed the video from with Mary, the one from last Monday that I loaded. Mary's been riding for a long time, decades, and she still doesn't know how to shift. <laughs> and we've had a conversation because I'm here with her and I, you know, this was months ago and I left it alone because I've, you know, it came up 
She, she was struggling on a climb. And I told her downshift. I put my hand in her back a long time ago. It was on a, a big hill that those guys had attacked Paul and I on. And so because of that situation that I helped her, then she thanked me for the help. So I felt like that was an open door. So then I told her, here's why you were struggling. You need to use your gears better. But she, she hasn't changed her style. She's just comfortable. So then she starts. She goes to the smallest cog in the back and is on the big chain ring. And early in the ride, she's like this. So whenever the pace gets hectic, she can't respond, you know. And so I, I've left her alone. You know, I've done my part. So I, I wait for an opening and try to help people and steer them in the right, you know, direction. And, it, you know, I've gotten people, the local guys here, they think they know it. Everybody says they think they know it, but then you see them making mistakes. And I just watch them. I keep quiet because if they're not seeking the information, then that's there. They know about the channel just like you guys. So, you know, I don't I don't want to go on the ride and bother everybody. I've said that before. I just go and I ride. And that's it. I'm off. When I'm riding, I'm not working. I'm off. <laughs> I'm just there to ride. So, yeah, um, you're welcome. Let's see. DD greetings from old England. Oh, it's that, it's that cold. That's old. Oh, okay. That's from England. Yeah, because I was talking about New England. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you guys are England, and then you have um, – I'm glad you mentioned that. It's funny how my brain works. I was watching something on Netflix. You may or may not be familiar with it. It's, called, it's in a town called Galway, and I believe Galway is somewhere in Ireland. Um. It's it's called uh, the guy is called John Taylor. He's a detective. They call them guards, and I guess guards is synonymous with officers or police, you know. And I just I got drawn. I, I watched one episode and just could not stop. <laughs> and it was like because it was one of these detective shows where it wasn't obvious what was going on. There was always a twist, and it was just fascinating how this guy was getting his minor. And he drinks all the time. You know, he's an Irish guy. He goes in a pub and he has a drinking problem and it's no big deal. He just drinks because he's drowning himself to forget issues that he had or whatever. But anyway, it's very involved. But if you're on Netflix, John Taylor, I recommend that. It's very good. So when I'm tired and I need to put my legs up, that's what I do. Put my legs up and watch to recover. But Galway, I looked it up. It's a city out there. And I know they've got Northern, Northern Ireland, I believe. I think Northern Ireland is a part of the UK, and I think the Republic of Ireland is not. So I've been reading up just to understand, you know. So is there, it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of people assume that, like Dublin, I believe Dublin is part of the Republic of Ireland or something like that. So it's, it's a little tricky. Some people mess up and they think the Republic of Ireland is a part of the UK, but it's not. So they got a lot of things going on there. So when he said old England, that kind of triggered that. <clears throat> yeah, so Paul said, yes, man, I'll be available. We'll film it. Yeah, I mean, we it's just been crazy. Uh, and, and I'm glad that I mentioned I was gone for almost seven days straight and then came back late Friday night. So it just wouldn't have been practical to try to get up Saturday Go do the ride. I would have been tired and dragging or whatever. I could probably still ride, but it it wouldn't have felt the same. <laughs> so I just slept in the vacation. I needed a, a break from the vacation. <laughs> you know, it was almost like I had jet lag because the hours when you're on vacation, you know, the kids are up late and all that. It was just everything was just messed up. So I told my wife the next vacation, the bike's going with us. <laughs> so so the, that's the deal because it'd be like a cycling related vacation. So Ian here currently, Ian says currently he rides a 58 specialized Roubaix frame set. I'll check dimensions and make sure I get the right time. I'm also looking to use the compact EPS record. Okay. Yeah. Um, since you know what group oil you need, then yeah, you can order your group set and you know, you will save a lot if you order the frame set. And source your own group set, like say from Merlin Cycles or somewhere, because that's how I did mine. I bought Campagnola Super Record at the price of the Dura Ace because I sourced it myself. Whereas if you try to buy a full bike, it's marked up. 
So you could do that. But then if the 58, if you're happy with the 58, because uh, what they call a 58, they're probably measuring it at the top. And so that means it's probably a 56, you know, if you do center to center or whatever. But if, if you're happy with that size or you know what you want, you just see how it compares. See how the dimensions compare with Colnago. Colnago will have the charts on their website to where you can look at it and make sure, you know, you don't buy a frame every day. So take your time and make sure you get it right. And you can just order the frame set, order your grupo, and then talk to your, your shop. They'll put it together for you. You could probably talk to them before you even consider that. But, I, you know, I build my own bikes, so I never buy a full frame set. I get the pieces and I build it up. It takes a couple of hours. And that's what they charge you for at the bike shop, their labor. So here's like 100, 150 bucks. We'll get you a bike put together. Let's see here. Shady Optics. Interesting name. How do you deal with sweat in your eyes on hot, humid days? <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, that that is very relevant. Um, the helmet, the Bell Zephyr, wicks, keeps the sweat out of my eyes. The Giro Scent is not as good. So when I wear the Giro Scent, if you looked at those of you who saw the ride, I have a bandana that I wear. We, I have many colors of them, but I usually wear the white or something. The bandana is a cool max material, very breathable. And I think someone made a joke on one of the rides that I was kind of like acting like Pantani because it's got a ponytail. It's kind of cool. And so we have different colors of them. You put that bandana on and the, the perspiration from your head is absorbed. And, and it literally wicks the moisture so you don't have it falling into your eyes. And that's the biggest thing. Um, if it does happen, regardless, I don't use a bandana on every ride. A lot of times what I do is it's not that often. With the, with the bell, I don't have that problem. But if it does happen, I always have one bottle with just water. And then if I have electrolytes in another bottle, the water is there for that. Splash it in, you take your glasses off and, and douse yourself. In fact, what I talked about earlier, when it gets really hot, I'll put the water on my head. I don't do that if I'm wearing a bandana, but if I'm not, I'll just pour the water in the helmet and it just comes out. I remove my glasses and it comes down and wash that's enough. Just wash your eyes with your water. Always have water with you, even though you know you think you want Gatorade or whatever it is you carry, put that in one bottle, but always have water. You never know. Bug might get in your eye. I always have a bottle of water for that per for those purposes. You know, you want to wash your hands, whatever. It's not just for drinking because I drink at the stops. I don't depend on the bottles. The bottles are extra. When we stop, I drink while I'm there. <laughs> and you, because, you know, the, the old adage is it's better to carry the water inside, you know. <laughs> so never, never wait till you're thirsty, then you're behind. So when you're riding, Every 10 minutes or so, take a drink, especially in the heat. In the heat, you don't have to be reminded. It's in the winter that you can forget. So, yeah. So, just wash your eyes. Just spray it on, you know. But your helmet should be, a lot of the helmets have brow pads. That helps. So, you don't need a bandana necessarily. A lot of the helmets have brow pads that will work. But if you find that you sweat more profusely than others, then, yeah, you can wash your eyes or wear a bandana. But make sure the bandana is made out of a wicking, lightweight material so you don't overheat. When I put the bandana on, I still feel the air. Not as much when it's not there, but still, it's comfortable. I don't, I don't, I don't overheat because it's there. So they sell them. You know, I have links on the website for the recommended cycling products, but you can find them anywhere. So, yeah, that's how, that's how I deal with that. Yes, that is an issue. Um, let's see here. Edgar Cole. I have two sets of wheels, one alloy and one carbon been there. I guess it's too much to ask that some brilliant engineer develop a compound for brake pads. That's effective on both. Okay. <laughs> yes. It's too much to ask. And here's why Edgar, the, when you use your brake pads on the aluminum rims, there are little filings of, of aluminum that get in the pads. You don't see them that much, but they're there. You don't want to use them on carbon. It would just it would chew the carbon. That's the main reason why you have to switch them. That's the reason why I sold my, my, my carbon wheel. Among other things, I have zipped them, just made a lot of noise. I sold them because I got tired of 
swapping the pads every time I would change the wheels. So the wheels I have, they're Shimano C35. They have like the C40 and other ones. They're carbon, and then the rim, the braking surface is aluminum. So I don't have to bob. I just switch the wheels, and they're ready to go. So that's that's one option. Yeah, you never want to use the same pads because if you took your pads off the bike and you looked at them, you will find little aluminum filings in there. Over time, you get little specks in there, and that's why. And plus, I think the carbon, uh, the, the, the compound is harder. But it's the, the main thing is just the things that get stuck in the, the, the pads that may tear up your rims. And then when they tell you it will void your warranty if you do that, yeah, it'll stop you, but it'll, it'll ruin your wheels. So no, yeah, it's a hassle. I, I used, I got tired of it. I sold my carbon wheels. You know, carbon wheels are fine. If I had them, I would probably use them on faster rides or whatever. I wouldn't train on them. It's just they're too delicate, you know, to be riding every day, you know. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, let's see. V Valiant Flood. He said, hello, I just started back riding, recovering from broken collarbone. I hope your recovery goes well. Um, a lot of times when, when, when you have a broken collarbone, you, I, guess, I guess you're on the trainer. You have to be on the trainer for a while until you can tolerate the vibration. When I competed, I had a fall one time. I didn't break my collarbone, my shoulder dislocated and came forward, ended up pushing it back. But it took like 12 weeks to be 100%. You know, it's been fine. I haven't had any problems with it. But the first week or so, it, it's like if you try to go on the road, you could feel the vibration. And, you know, so I had to stay on the trainer for about a week. I don't know about the broken collarbone, but your doctor would tell you. It, it's just a vibration from the bars. But for the most part, yeah, on the trainer, you should be okay. You should be able to maintain your fitness with a broken collarbone. Just stay on the trainer until it heals to where you can tolerate being on the road. Kiwi Gamer 2019. <clears throat> so uh, somebody's recommending a bike shop called Blue Line Bike Labs on Heights Boulevard. Roman Rodriguez says they're good. Yeah, that's good. Life with the Bakers. How you doing? Welcome. John Bailey. Hello, Eldred. Sent your video on how to get back to riding after a break to a few buddies. Getting to the upper 50s and some have stepped off the bike and it's sad to see. Well, just tell them that uh, it's, it's a delicate balance, uh, John. They need to do something for their health because being sedentary creates disease. Just tell them that. Just sitting around doing nothing creates certain illnesses. And you're just gonna you're gonna get sick because your body is a machine and you gotta use it. You know. So just let them know they need to do something. If it's not riding, go for a walk. I don't care. You need to use your body. And our society in the West, we sit. In a car, at work, at home, we're just sitting. You know, that's why I mentioned people don't even know their neighbors. Nobody goes outside. You know, so you know, so you, you got to do something. So they need to be active and take care of their health because if they don't, they're going to be spending time sitting in a waiting room waiting on the doctor down the road. So Ian, oh, Ian says he built. Okay, you build your own. Yeah, so you're you're set then. Yeah, you put it together. Um, you just need to find out, since you build, you know, you need to find out what kind of bottom bracket they, re they require with their frame. If it's press fit, a lot of times with the press fit, I recommend that you use the Loctite. I've used 609 on, on Allen's bike. Uh, if you don't use the Loctite, sometimes the tolerances are, can be off, depending on where you get the bottom bracket from, and it will creak. That's what causes those creaking. Nothing major, but that's just, that's the way to do it. 
some people skip that step at the shops and then we ride with guys all day long their bikes team rr you just hear creaking <laughs> i don't know it, it, i don't know why it doesn't drive them crazy you know i don't like noise on my bike if there's a noise i gotta find out what's causing it uh enzo says he's late for the show he's been listening to my cycling advice and applying to his writing i'm able to ride longer in my cadence well, I'm glad the channel has helped you. That's great. That's why we set it up, Enzo. <clears throat> so Kiwi Gamer says he has a 2007 Giant Yukon mountain bike. Would like to get a Giant Rome sometime. Yeah, mountain bike's fine, man. Yeah, you just If it fits you, swap the wheels, get on the road. You know, I'll get get wheels for road and dirt. You're good to go. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to buy anything else. There's a lot of guys can you be able to ride with a group with a mountain bike. That, that, that freaks people out. <laughs> You're in good shape. You show up with a mountain bike, put the right tires on there, and sit in the back, spin. TV. He says, any knowledge on the AMP human performance PR lotion with bicarb? No, sir. Never heard of that. AMP Human Performance PR Lotion. Let's see what that is. I'm always game to learn something new. Human Performance PR Lotion. Athletic Performance Lotion. And 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 they put our Texan Lance on there. <laughs> I guess I guess he's uh, one of the the spokespeople for it. Let's see, human performance. PR lotion is the first and only pre-workout product that gives your body more bicarb, a natural electrolyte, to help you push your limits. Bicarb occurs naturally in our bodies, and its role, unlike other, is to neutralize. The acid that builds up in your muscles when you train hard. Apply PR lotion before every workout. But if you have it in your body, why do you need a lotion? Just curious. Apply PR lotion before every workout, adventure, and event to push your body further and recover faster so that you can come back strong the next day, trusted by the world's best. They, they've got – this is just another brand. They've got a few others. I saw – there was a guy who used to, used to ride in the U.K. He's now a triathlete. He retired early from road racing. I forgot his name, but he's 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 supporting another one. I mean, you just have to try it, I guess. You know, I uh, you know it may it's hard to say. You know, how do you see whether it's effective or not? You know, it's like you'd have to test it. You'd have to do like a your own little test, see whether it's getting you back stronger. Uh, I recover with food and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right now, you know, and then uh, what was that thing? Uh, high five right after my rides. I have I have a process, so you know, I don't know. Probably probably okay. It's just a lotion, but you know, but that's a marketing thing. So you're gonna have to try. Maybe get a sample or something. Maybe get them to if they want people to buy these kind of things, they need to give it to you. Give you a trial package, and you test it, see if it works, and then you spend your money on it. Because that may just be marketing gobbledygook. Hard to know. There's quite a few different, there's quite a few of them out there, different brands that are saying that you can put them on your legs and before you go out and it's supposed to help, you know. But I don't know. There's always something, but give it a try and let us know. I mean, I, I just, I, I wouldn't, don't buy a big package, get a small one and see if you can tell the difference. Um, let's see here. <laughs> John Hill, what are good sunglasses to buy? <laughs> you guys know what I'm going to say. I have fallen in love with the flyweight. John, you must have missed that, uh, the last uh, live session. Yeah, I recommend the, let me, let me get the link here. Rafa ought to pay me for this. Um, let's see. The, Rafa has a pair of sunglasses that didn't advertise. I stumbled upon it. I have a pair. And since I got them, it's the only thing I'm wearing. 
they just work. So, you know, I have to recommend them. Let's see, because they just work. I love everything about them. And as soon as I get some funds, I will get some other lenses because they, they allow you to get other lenses. It's easy to switch. They call it the flyway. Let me see if I can search and find the link so you don't have to look, John. Flyweight, uh, protein flyweight glasses. Uh, let's see what name they use. Let's see. I'm on the Rafa site. I'm searching for it. I believe it's under. Since they changed their site. They have all these pictures. Everything's just huge, the jerseys, whatever. It's it's a bit intensive when you have a lot of applications running, <laughs> you know, because it's pictures. You're loading pictures, and it's uh, – let me go under. So if you go to men and you go to accessories, let's see, writing accessories. I think that's where I saw it. There we go. Yeah, um, here's the link. I like them. They come with two nose pieces. A small one is attached when it, when you get it. And then um, I just switched it and put the bigger one there because it lifts it off your face more so you don't get smudges on the lenses. But I really like them. I got the – and you just have to make the decision which arm you want because they have no frame, but they work. I really like using them. So I definitely recommend them highly. Uh, let's see. So Ian is asking whether the stack and reach. Yeah, the, the, the what happens to Ian is these, the modern bikes with the sloping top tube, the stack is a different measurement that they're using now versus what we used to use for center to center for conventional stuff. So yeah, the reach is critical because you want enough top tube and then your measurement needs to be parallel. You can't measure along the slope. It needs to be parallel to get the correct length. But if you get the right size, see, they give you a top tube length so you can see how close it is to what you have because you need to know what top tube length because that's important. The stack is the size, basically. That's what they're using for these sloping bikes. And you need to know, if you look at the diagram, they'll tell you how they're determining the stack because they'll tell you some of the manufacturers will show you uh, bottom bracket, what we call center to top, and then it'll show you center to center. So you can see the two measurements to make sure you, you get in the right size. <laughs> Kiwi Gimmer said, yeah, I can't wash your eyes with Gatorade. Yeah, you don't want to do that. In fact, it can happen. You can get careless. So what I do when I ride, my electrolyte is on the vertical seat tube. That's why I keep my electrolyte. Water, I put on the down tube. The main reason is these bottles we have, they leak. They can leak. And so I must try to put the water on the down tube because if it leaks, it's just water. Whereas I put any electrolyte standing straight upright so I don't get any sticky stuff on my bike. That's that's the reason I've always done it that way. But it, it, it as a result, when I need Gatorade or whatever electrolyte mix, I use Vitalite. I reach for that. That's where it is. I know where water is. I know where that is. And that's, that's a good thing to do because if you put Gatorade on the down tube, all that bouncing, if you didn't close the bottle properly, it will leak on your bike and get home. You get all that sticky streak. I hate that. It's harder to clean when it hardens, you know, the sugary stuff. So that's a good way to do that. So you always know where your electrolyte is. And then when it's a doubt, you just taste it before you splash it on your face. <laughs> so uh, let's see here. I want to make sure I didn't miss my super legend there. Um, okay, let's go. Life with bikes. I have a Trek 1.5 with Shimano shifters. 
with, with Tiagra derailleur. Should I upgrade my group set or invest in a Garmin? A Garmin. He says Garmin year unit. I guess you mean head unit. Um, whenever whenever people say upgrade, uh, especially with a group set, if if the Tiagra is working fine, then what's the reasoning for upgrading per se? If you've got a good frame to start with, yeah, you can upgrade because you want nicer shifters or whatever, but you're not going to feel that impact per se. If you don't have a head unit, I'd get a head unit first. You know, you can get them, you can shop around. And the, the prices are reasonable depending on which size you get. You can get the 520. You know, get it based on what size you prefer because uh, I have the 1,000. I, I never use the maps. It's there. I just don't use it. You know, when, whenever I would go and do a course, you guys that have been here, you can do like end-to-end -end point directions where it gives you direction like a regular nav. Then I would use that. But it, it's rare. So you don't really need the map that much. And all of them have navigation in them. It's just that the smaller ones doesn't have the fancier maps, like the 5 Series. I don't know. They may have improved them now. But I got the 1,000 because the text is bigger. You can see it easier. Everything about it was just enhanced from the 800 that I had before. So it was just a nice change to that. But it, it's, it, it's the biggest size they have. But, you know, and I like it. It's all right. It's not too clunky, but it's also pricey. It's one of the more expensive ones. So look at your budget and pick which size. I got the 5, 8, and the 1,000 series. I don't know what numbers they have out now. I don't keep up with stuff. I only buy stuff when they break. And the 1,000 I've had for years. I don't know how long, at least two or three years or whatever. As long as it's working, I don't care what they're coming out with because this one works. <laughs> You know, I don't need to keep up with that. You know, a lot of people do that. Oh, they came up with the 1,030 or whatever they call them now. That's fine. The next time I need another one, I will get the one that's out at that time. You don't need to keep changing your stuff. And so you can find them on eBay, wherever. Just shop around, get the right price for whatever series you want to get. But get a head unit and then get a cadence sensor that you can pair with that so you can track your cadence. That's more important than... Uh, Shift the uh, upgrade of your derailleur right now because if you don't have a head unit, that means you're not tracking your performance, you know, your engine. So that way you can start, you know, focusing on keeping your cadence up. The cadence is the first thing on my head unit, that's what I pay attention to. That's my engine, that's my RPM, that's your pistons. So when you start getting out of breath and you're pedaling at 105, you're like, oh, my body doesn't like 105, I need to shift up or slow down. That's what you use that for. So, yeah, get that first. Get your head unit, get your, uh, and then get a speed sensor if you ride indoors because you'll need to put that on the wheel when you're not moving because GPS will do your speed when you're moving. But when you're indoors, the unit won't come on because it, without the speed sensor, it doesn't know you, you're doing anything. So, you need a speed sensor and a cadence meter. And the new ones are, you don't need magnets, they have accelerometer in the cadence sensor. I like that. You just put it on the crank arm. You're good to go. You pair it. Good to go. It uses a 2032 battery. So, yeah, that's the first one I think you should go with. All right. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, head unit. Okay, I got that right. Let's see. Edgar is thanking me. He said he had no idea. I don't know what I was talking about here. Oh, okay. Yeah, the wheels. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Edgar is thanking me because I mentioned that you don't want to pad to share with carbon and aluminum. Yeah, the aluminum, they leave stuff in there. Some of them you can't see, but it's there. <laughs> so, you know, um, you'll never wear out a pair of aluminum wheels. I haven't. I've never worn out. Like people say, oh, you break too much, you wear out the rims. I've never worn out rims. So I don't know why they say that. I don't know who's wearing out rims where. Because that takes special skill. you got to be coming down a mountain pass and grinding that thing repeatedly. I, You know. It just doesn't happen. I've never had to replace brake pads. You know, I've, I've replaced group sets before I had to replace brake, brake pads or I've replaced wheels. So they, they, they last for so long. So you take your time, get what you like, and just use them. 
And yeah, that was my reason for going back to the Shimano C30. I got tired of every weekend pushing the pads out, putting new ones. Like they need to come up with something. So, so if you're one of those that have, say, a bike coming up, maybe you are candidate for disc brakes then. So then you can just use wheels. You don't have to worry about. It. But then you have to get wheels that, that for discs, and then you you go that route because it's hard to go from caliper to discs because then all your other wheels are only for the bikes with calipers because the disc wheels are engineered with discs. That's the thing. So choose which one you want. Stay with that, and then you're better off. I'm, I'm watching a tour, and I, I watch even in the breakaway. And there might be two guys with discs, and you got four guys with regular. So even the pros have not fully switched to discs. <laughs> you know, so so somebody had mentioned that it, you know, discs were taking over or whatever. No, that's not the case. I'm not sure why they haven't, but I heard early in the season some of the teams were like, nah, we're not gonna do that. But I think it's preference, you know, because even the guy who won yes uh, uh a Monday than art. I think he has a regular uh, brake set. So yeah, so you look at the Peloton, you know, a few some guys have this and a lot of guys have regular stuff. I don't think it's that big a deal. You know, they're just brakes. They're not that big. It's not a big choice. You know, it's not a big thing. The frame set is more important. And all that, you know, so yeah. But you know, the, the ones that they have look, I like how the size of the discs are about the size of the cassette. So when you look at it from the side, you just they're just they, they, they blend nicely. The aesthetics look pretty good, you know. So they're they're improving them. So you know, they're just breaks. It shouldn't be a decision maker. If you want it, you get it. No big deal. You know, we don't, we're told not to break that much anyway. You know, you tap them, slow down a little bit, or use the wind. Yeah. So. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Hmm. El, I've seen this guy before. El Chicon Goyo. Interesting name. <laughs> do you follow the Tour de France? Who do you think will win? This year, I have no idea. But the top guys are there. It's hard to say, really. You've got... Uh, I don't think Alaphilippe will win. Uh, he's not that strong of a climber in the Alpine stages high altitude stuff so you got bernal who is third now i believe and then of course the, the defending champion if it, the, it's hard to say who will win because there's so many variables anything can happen somebody can get sick or whatever those guys are going through a lot three weeks you know eating strange foods and all that kind of stuff you know a lot of stuff can happen so but as far as the strong guys are the, 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 you look at the top 10 any one of those guys you know but of course Garan Thomas is a favorite because he's got the the pedigree. He won last year and he's in good form this year. Just watching the fact that he had a crash that I talked about where his teammates bike broke and he was able to get back. One of his teammates pulled into the tail of the Peloton and then he rode up. And so he didn't lose too much time. You know, lost about 20 seconds to uh, Thibault, was that Pinot, that French guy who, who ended up losing minutes on Monday. So, yeah, so it's going to be you know, the, the top five guys. Any one of them can win, you know. And so, but, it's, yeah, Alaphilippe is enjoying this now, but, you know, he knows. He's, he's not going to be up there when those guys hit the high altitude. It's just, you know, Bernal and what was the guy named um, Quintana, they grew up at altitude. And that's the thing. You, you don't have enough oxygen. You can't put out the, the watts. So, you know, these guys, Quintana – it's not that heavy, and he's a strong climber. So once they get up, it's going to be – that's why I watch it. I don't know who's going to win. <laughs> it's kind of like watching a movie. You don't know the end of the story yet. So, yeah. And I like that. This year has been more interesting from my standpoint because every stage has had a different winner. I haven't seen the result for the day yet. But every stage, the first 10 stages had different winners each day. So that that's a good race. Nobody's controlling anything. These boys are just going at it. So it, it, this is this is an interesting tour. <clears throat> I 
Enzo T. Enzo says, uh, Eldred, is it critical to have the rotation marks on a smooth tire in the correct direction? I changed out my tires yesterday and I did not pay attention. My rear tire isn't. What are the marks for? Yes. If they put marks on there, then what, what, what that means is the manufacturer of the tire set a particular direction for the rotation for you to get the best enjoyment and life out of your tire. So you, it doesn't take that long to switch it around. So I think you should follow that. Not every tire has that rotation on there. So if they put it on there, don't ignore it. It's the same thing with car tires. Uh, there are some tires like Michelin Pilot Sport has a rotation mark. So when you go to discount tire or wherever, they look at that when they put it on your car. There are other car tires that don't have it. They just put it on anyway. So if it's there, yes, don't ignore it. It just it just performs better because they have you know you're dealing with the rubber and it's been engineered to move in that direction. So yeah, why not? Uh, this guy stick on a tree says, "How often do you change out your chain?" Good question. I change out my chain based on the wear that I get from my wear indicator that I use. And the reason is that there is no rule. You know, you hear people say, oh, once a year, or 7,000 kilometers, whatever. That means nothing because I clean my body, I clean my drivetrain after every ride. I get the debris off the chain because that's part of, that's what wears your chain. I wipe it down and then put the bike up. You don't need to lube it after every ride. You just wipe the debris. Our drivetrain is in the open, so we pick up crap. And then, so when you lube your chain, you need to make sure there's no oil on the surface because the oil should go on the pins in there. That's where you're lubing. Any oil that you can see is just a dirt magnet. And then people leave. You see guys with the chains black. That, that person is going to have to replace that chain a lot sooner than I will. And a lot of them don't. And when you don't replace your chain, it wears out your cassettes. Chain's a lot cheaper than the cassette. So $30 chain wearing out a $300-something cassette, do the math. So you need to get a chain tool. Park Tool makes one. Um, you can go to our website, uh, veloharmony.com, recommended cycling products. i got a link for that because people have asked. But get, get the chain tool so that you just drop it in there and it'll let you know. They got a 0.5 and a 0.75. When it gets to 0.5, it's time to order a chain so you can you know, be ready. And at 0.75, get it off the bike. And for me, that can be anywhere from 12 to 18 months or more because I have several bikes. And so the use is spread. So, yeah, if I were doing it by time, I'd be guessing. That, that eliminates the guesswork. Don't fall for the other stuff because if you don't take care of the chain, it will work quicker. It stretches basically the links, lengthen. And, you know, you need to put a new one on it because when they lengthen, then it start wearing out the cogs you use the most. And then when you put a new chain on there, it will start skipping because it, it wears your cog and then you'll need a new cassette or at least replace that one cog. So, yeah, get the chain tool. There's no timeline on there that, that's adequate. Let's put it that way because it varies with wear. And I mean, with the use and where you live, if you're in a dusty area, you're not cleaning the stuff, it's going to wear more, you know, you ride in the rain and you don't take care of it. So if you don't take care of stuff, it wears out. That's anything, you know, so that's that's the way it is. So with all that variety, that's, that's the bike shops always have that because when you bring your bike in, they'll just drop it in there because they're not following you around to know what you're doing. A lot of bike shops, you take your bike, they clean it first, and they charge you for cleaning it because they don't like to work on dirty bikes, and I don't blame them. If I'm on a ride and somebody has a flat or whatever and their chain's dirty, I, I don't help them. <laughs> I may hold the frame for them, but I'm not putting my hand on that. So there's no reason for your chain to be dirty. Keep it clean. It will last. But, yeah, get that chain tool so you know. And if you do your own repairs, then just keep a spare chain at home. I always have a chain for the bike at least one extra one. So when it's time to change it, I don't need to run to the shop. You can get them on sale and keep it. Keep it in your, your tool bin. But that's the best way to go. John Marino, if you have disc brakes, you won't need to swap paths between ILO and carbon wheels. 
he was talking about somebody that I'd mentioned that. <clears throat> so Edgar says, hey, John, yep, that makes sense. I'd love to have disc brakes. Unfortunately, I can't retrofit those. Don't bother. Don't retrofit that. It looks like crap when you do. If the bike is designed with this, the wires are routed better. There's no reason. Brakes are not that big a deal. I understand you're having a challenge with swapping between carbon and that, but you know the brakes we have on the bikes they stop fine because this disc brakes for road bikes is just a marketing thing. So don't go, don't don't retrofit. If you're buying a new bike and you want to get discs, that's the way to go. But just know that you're going to have different set of wheels now for that bike going forward. But yeah, with your bike you're fine. Um, with the carbon thing that you have, yes, you have to switch the pads. And it, it can be a headache, especially if you got one frame. And I went through that. I ended up selling the carbon wheels because I really wasn't using them that much. They're so delicate. You know, I don't want to wonder when I hit something whether the wheel is still there. And I had a bad experience with carbon bars that caused me to crash because they had a catastrophic failure on a ride. So I, I use aluminum bars. All my frames are made out of metal, <laughs> you know, and uh, I ride aluminum Zondas for the most part, aluminum wheels and, you know, and carbon wheels are fine, I think. But, you know, like I said earlier, you have a carbon bike, get some insurance on it. And I think you can put it on your homeowners or whatever. Just make sure it's covered because the, the way they're breaking, like the one that broke in the tour, the little crash. It wasn't it wasn't anything that should have happened to that frame and that thing snapped. And that's the F12. That's a thirteen thousand plus dollar frame. So that's just they need I don't know if the warranty will cover it. I don't know how to do but those guys in the tour don't care. They don't buy those. But you're spending your own money. Just make sure you're covered. Let's see. Edgar Cole says, Yes, I've recently had sports drink run down the tube. To the cable guy. Yeah, it gets sticky under the cable guys, underneath the bottom bracket where it caused the shift cable to see. Yep. Because you didn't catch it. So it just kept, it's like sugar building up. I'm surprised that a bee wasn't following you because we have these bees that some of the stores we stop at, they hang around the trash can. Well, the Gatorade, people drop the bottle with, with stuff left in there and the bees, you know, hang around there. So yeah, that, that's it. I, I hate stuff on my bike. I clean my bike, you know, so I check. And over the years, yeah, that's just, it's nothing new. It just happens. And people who don't pay attention to that have the problem with the cable season, and then you just have to put some water on there and get it out of there. But it's a, it's a cleanup job. You know, it's a kind of a bit of, bit of a dirty job. And so Jason says, Gatorade caused my front derailleur to seize, did not know it was leaking on it. Yep. Yeah. So keep just make sure the bottles you have, like the, the bottles we use now, they're insulated and they're made by, um, what's the, a lot of the guys on the tour use them. Uh, I forgot the name of the company that makes them, but uh, they, they don't leak easily, but all of them do, you know, you, because what happens, what I do is when I make my electrolyte drink, I shake the bottle, then I pop the top because it releases whatever vapors are in there, the foam. If you don't do that, I've literally had it pop the top off the bottle because that top can come off, you know, for cleaning or whatever. And so as a habit, when I shake it, I do that. Then I turn the, the top a little more and it always seems to move because you always get some drips or whatever. Then once that settles, it's okay. And then, but I, I put it vertically so I don't have to worry about it on the down tube. So yes, they can leak. I, you know, and so I look for that. Even though I put it on the down tube, I still look when I get home, make sure there's nothing on there. Usually it's good. So it has to do with the bottle you have and where you put it and how tightly that top sits on there. Because sometimes you get air in there. And if you're in a hurry and you don't close it properly, it can drip. You know, it can be a little messy. <clears throat> DJ Tony says, shout out. Just come on by, buddy. We're right out here. We're on the north side. Come on by whenever you can, DJ. Let's see. Uh, Jimmy Richard, Johnny Richardson says, what type of camera do you recommend for your bike? I don't have a camera for my bike. I'm not sure what you mean. The camera is not for my bike. I mean, I guess, I don't know if you need a camera to attach to your bike. I don't attach a camera on my bike. But um, 
I guess the GoPro, you can't go wrong with that. It's an activity camera, and they come with all the attachments. I think you have to buy them. I don't think this this sell it. I think they sell like a little basic attachment for your bars. But putting the camera on your bars, just nobody wants to watch that film. It shakes too much. It's like this. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. But the GoPro is the way to go. You know, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Paul says they have a 1030 Garmin I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, they, the, the 1000 I've had, no problem. It's been bomb proof. And all the Garmin's I've had, they just work. I just like that you can buy a $20 belt or whatever, and it just pairs and you're ready to go with your heart rate. You can buy the accelerometer all the speed, the cadence, speed sensor, and so forth. And you just, you just buy the accessories, and it'll pair, and you're ready to go. So you get the head unit, and it will just work with so many other things. And then you get any power meter, for those of you who are buying power meters, and you just pair it, and you're ready to go. And then the other guys have the same thing. I think Wahoo, they got a belt. They got their own belt for the heart rate and so forth. So there's so many things out there you know, that you can just get. But I think that it's better to get a cycling head unit. Those of you who saw the films a few weeks back, there was a guy named Brian riding with us, messing with his phone. He put his big phone, <laughs> just a huge phone, on the stem on some attachment, and it was moving. And he's messing with it and then closing gaps that he's creating. I, you're not going to see me put my phone on the bike. No. Not only does it spoil the lines of the bike, the aesthetics are just wrong. The phone's expensive. I don't want that crap to fall. <laughs> so, you know, I parked that thing away. You don't, you know, what do you need the phone for? If you, if, even if you have an app on the phone, you don't need to see it. Turn the app on, put it in your pocket. It'll work. You don't need it on the bike. Because some people track their stuff on the phone, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be on the bike. Just put it in your pocket. It's a lot safer than having it on the bike. It bounces and falls and stuff. They got all these weird attachments. It just look all clunky. I hate putting stuff on my bike. I like to keep the bicycle simple. That's the beauty of the bicycle. The diamond frame, two wheels, handlebars. Let's go. <laughs> uh, so Enzo says, thanks for your help. I really appreciate you taking the time to answer when you have no idea how much more I enjoy cycling because of your channel. You got to go change your tire. Yes, please change your tire. Do it right. You will you will enjoy it. That's why they do that. That sounds like you got a pretty pricey pair of tires. It's not on, there are very few tires that have that wear indicator. So that means a performance tire. So that's all the more reason for you to have that on there. So you can get the performance you paid for. You're welcome, Enzo. So John Marino says some rims have wear indicators and should be replaced when visible. Yes, exactly. I've never had that problem. I, you know, I don't break that much. Look at it this way. Some of you may have had this experience. If you brake too hard sometimes, you can flat spot your tire. Because you remember, we don't have a lot of rubber. A lot of you guys riding 20, 23. You know, back in the day, people would ride 18, 19. Now everybody's 23, 20, whatever. That's not a whole lot of rubber. So when you lock up, um, how can I explain it? Braking is not just the pads or the discs. It's the rubber. So you got to have the rubber to receive. I think disc brakes are too powerful for the little tires we got on our road bikes anyway. Because if you brake too hard, the, the back tire locks up, you can flat spot it and you need a new tire. So yeah, you know, uh, we, we're told, especially in a pace line or whatever, I, I rarely lock up my brakes because I'm always looking or whatever, especially in a group. You're not supposed to be braking that hard, you know, but emergencies can happen. But it's not that often. So I've never had the opportunity to wear out a pair of rims. That's where I was coming from with that. So you have to do something pretty. You have to be doing a lot of braking to wear out the rims or ride in a wet, get the rim filthy and don't clean it and then grind it you know, with the debris or whatever, you know. So that's not very often. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, – th that's why I said it just breaks. Seasoned riders don't use their brakes that much. 
You use friction, use the wind, uh, whatever, to slow you down. That's the reason we call out stopping and all that. So people are not doing emergency braking. People are slowing down, you know. And so that's the way, especially in a group. And even when you ride solo, I mean, how often are you locking up? You slow down. I usually, like, most of the time, I just pop my brakes. Just pop them, pop them. I set them to where, you know, you get nice modulation. So just keep that in mind. It's not that big a deal. You, If you're riding correctly, you should not be locking up your brakes. You should be paying attention to what's happening on the roadway when you're out there. You know, you, you should be ready in case of an emergency. But, you know, and, and I've made a video about how to transfer your weight if you have to stop suddenly so you don't flip over, you know. Yeah. Mm. So John believes that eventually we'll see most pro riders using flat mount hydraulic disc brakes with 140 millimeter rotors. Could be. They're not paying for it. <laughs> so they don't have, you know, but uh, you you may, but there are going to be some riders that prefer, especially the climbers. They're not going to be carrying an extra weight of disc brakes up the mountain passes. If you look at th this year's tour, the top climbers, they don't have discs on their bike. That's extra weight. And when it comes to climbing at altitude, you know, just climbing in general, you're doing a hill time trial, you don't want discs on your bike. You lighten the load. That's why, uh, what's the name? Uh, Ineos, the, the crash they, the guy had and the, the frame snapped, the wheels on the bike alone cost five grand. They spent money, even though they have sponsors, they spent money because Lightweight is not their sponsor. They had to buy those wheels from Lightweight and they're five grand for a pair because Ineos wanted marginal gains, you know. So they, they, they're they not going to put disc brakes on the bike after lightening up the wheels. That's why his, he had regular brakes on there, you know. So that's the thing. It, the rider will determine in the terrain or whatever because the braking is not a – there was nothing wrong with the other brakes. <laughs> so <laughs> – all right, let's see here. Um, Asborn, modulation is king with disc brakes. You can get modulation with a properly adjusted pair set of rim brakes too. And I'm not sure where you live, but I've I've descended mountains or whatever. You're not supposed to be riding your brakes. You brake to take the speed off, and then you go. That's the way you brake. A lot of people are scared, and they ride their brakes down the mountain. That's not how you descend. What's the point of that? When you come into the corner, you scrub the speed off, just like in a car at a racetrack. You don't ride with the brakes on. When you get into the corner, you brake to the proper speed, and then you accelerate out of the corner. That's how you ride. The, so people are using them wrong. Brakes are, have never been a problem. It's a marketing thing you, you guys are falling for. So, yeah, if you want disc brakes on your bike, that's great. But you're not gonna if you're doing it properly, you're going to be using them any more than the people that got rim brakes. All right, let's see here. Uh... What is the use of disc brakes if they cause you to slide and crash? Hmm. Well, I don't know if they'll cause you to slide and crash. Well, what I was explaining is that the, the power of the discs is only achieved by the tire you use. That's any kind of brake, even in a car. If you got crappy tires on your car and they're bald, you can have the best braking system. You're going to be sliding. Because the tires, that's where the grip is. And so we have little, our tires are small, so they, they have a limit. That's why you flat spot a bicycle tire when you stop. I've done it. I've had to stop real suddenly, and the back tire twitched. And there was it just basically went down to the wear. You could see I had to take the tire off when I got home. It happens with bicycles when you stop suddenly. So we don't stop hard that often because it's not good for the tires anyway. So if it's an emergency and you have to, yeah, you can. But that's not the way you stop normally. And that, that's my point. Breaking is not that big a deal. <laughs> you know? So you don't fall for the marketing hype. The, the challenge is going fast on a bicycle. That's stopping. Stopping is not a challenge. Going fast is. <laughs> so so you're using, if you're using your skills right, you use friction, the wind, and you take the speed off when you need to by braking gradually. That's what Asma talking about modulation. A lot of people have their rim brakes adjusted poorly. They're too close to the rim. So you don't have any modulation. It's just mushy. If you have it adjusted properly, you can modulate it. 
and slow down, take the speed off that you need to and go. There's a reason those brakes have worked for decades. They work. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, Edgar, he said, if I had known that sharing my experiences would result in my exposure as one who is not very fastidious about maintaining his bicycle. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I didn't think that. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Edgar. It doesn't mean you're not fastidious. I mean, everybody does different things. Some people just don't know, you know. So, MotoGP said, so thanks for all the tremendous info you provide. Never had the opportunity to join the live chat. Well, good, good to have you here, MotoGP. John Marino, I've ridden rim brakes for over 30 years. Hydraulic disc brake modulation is better. <clears throat> I'm very comfortable riding on my drops. I have spacers under my handlebar. Should I consider dropping my handlebar? If so does it require a bike fit adjustment? John Pena. If you're comfortable, then why would you change anything? The whole reason is comfort. So unless I see you on the bike, I wouldn't recommend you change anything because you open up, you said, I'm very comfortable riding on my drops. If you're comfortable everywhere, because the drops usually, if the bar is too low, a lot of riders can't get to the drop. So that means your bar is placed properly. I don't know if you've ever had a fit or not, John, but um, yeah, you don't want to just change things for no reason. If you're having a problem or you go to get a fit, then the fitter will check everything and, will, and, and a good fitter will explain why the adjustments need to be made. But if you're comfortable, don't mess with it. If it's working, don't, don't, don't fix, don't, there's nothing to fix. So uh, if you've never had a fit and you want to get a fit to make sure you're optimal, because just because you're comfortable on the drops, you don't, you don't pedal there. You're just holding the drops. You need to make sure you're comfortable other places because if you're not, if your weight is not seated properly on the saddle, you're not in the saddle and your, your cleats are not adjusted to where you can unload the saddle when you pedal. That's why a lot of people will ride and their feet hurt on a long ride because they got too much weight on their feet. They're not unloading. When you're optimized on your bike, sometimes when you're pedaling, it's almost like you feel like you're not, there's no effort going in to generate the speed because you're so efficient. You're using both of your legs and you're going through the, the, the cycle, you know? And when you go hard, your weight comes off the saddle naturally even in the drops and transfers to the pedals, you know, and you're not mashing. You're basically using the whole circle. So it, it's complicated, but a lot of riders don't get a fit. Everybody just fits themselves and they get out there and they have little problems. And then as they ride more and more, they start having other issues. And then the symptoms don't always tell you what's causing the problem. Just because your hands are numb doesn't mean it's the bars. You see? So, if you're not having a problem and everything else is fine, then I wouldn't change anything unless you go and get a fit. But you said fit adjustment. It sounds like you've had a fit done already. You know, so only change things to solve a problem. Don't change it for looks. You having spacers under there doesn't mean anything. The spacers may have put your bars where they need to be. Maybe the head tube was a little short for you, and they put spacers to bring the bars up. Not every your bike doesn't need to be slammed unless the frame was built properly with the right head tube for you and you already knew what you were getting. You know, that's the key. Um, we're gonna be wrapping up soon, a little over two hours. So you'll see here. Georgina Abunda says, I pedal with my knees to the side. I look like a frog. How can I improve on this issue? You can spot me a mile away. Um, we got a guy that pedals kind of like that. What's his name? Uh, <laughs> Greg Shot. Greg Shot kind of looks like I think he's bow legged. Um, I would I would suggest a fit. Uh, that's the first thing, Georgina, because uh, we'll see if that's just the way your body is, or whether the bike, maybe your your pedals not lined up, or your saddle height. There could be a lot of different reasons, but it starts with a fit. So. If you have a fitter that you trust or you're comfortable with, get somebody local to help you. If you don't, 
I can help you remotely. We do like a video session on the internet. If you're handy with tools and we can walk through it, if you have a trainer and all that, but it, it, it depends on what you want to do, but you need a fit. That will, that will let you know what the problem is. <clears throat> so let's see here. Focus fitness. I also pedal with legs to the side. How can I fix this problem? Yeah, bike fit. I think something's off. If you're pedaling with a leg, if you've never had a fit, then that's where you start. Because something's caught. You shouldn't have to pedal. Your knee should not be to the side. You know, if you're pedaling with a knee to the side, that means that saddle's too low or something like that can cause that. Something's causing you to bunch up. And you could be on a frame that's too small. It's so many different things. So it starts with a fit, assuming that you've got a frame you can work with, you know. So if you have a local fitter there, you can use that. If you don't have a fitter you trust, and you're handy with a few Allen wrenches and stuff, then you can sign up for our remote fit where we do it online with video. I've been doing that more than even the ones inside. I've done it for people even here in Houston that didn't want to drive to the north side. <laughs> so where I basically we do it together online. Let me get the link here. Um, but that's what you need. You, you shouldn't be pedaling with your knee to the side, you know, Theoretically, anyway, it depends. If you're bull legged, it could be a factor, but I don't know until I see. And you need to have a trainer to, to use this uh, service, just an indoor trainer and some tools. I've got it on here to where it tells you what you need. And you, you don't need to be a mechanic. We'll tell you what to do. You just need to have some Allen wrenches, like four, five, and six. And let's see here. Bike fit, remote. The, the remote internet bike fit was started a few years ago because people on here spent money locally where they were and they weren't happy with their fit. And they, so I started that to accommodate those that were not in the Houston area. And then I started getting people in Houston that wanted to use it because Houston is big. Houston might as well be a country. <laughs> you know, it's huge. So here's the link. You can sign up there if you want to do the remote fit. and it, just, it takes a couple of hours. But you need an indoor trainer and a few tools and a, like a ruler with a bubble. It tells you on there. All the details are there on the site. All right, guys. This is great. We A little over two hours. We're going to wrap up. We went a little longer than normal because of the – we missed it because of the vacation. But it's great to be back. And uh, I uh, enjoyed the session, and I hope you guys will get through hump day, which is Wednesday, and get ready for the weekend that's coming. I've got a review of a La Passion jersey that I got coming up on Friday. And I will get that out as soon as possible. Thanks all. Thank all of you super chatters and all my super legends and patrons. I appreciate you guys. Take care. <laughs>